Thank you. You may be seated. Well, today is Reformation Sunday, and we, in the tradition of the Reformation, believe in Christ alone, through faith alone, by grace alone. And yet today we have just read a passage out of James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26, that emphasizes works and tells us, can faith save him? if he has not works. How do we reconcile what we find in James chapter 2, especially in this portion of the text that we've read today, with the great doctrine of justification alone by faith, which was the battle cry of the Reformation? How can we say that when the scripture itself says, though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? So I'm asking a question. Can faith save him if he does not have works? And we find down here in several other places, uh, verse 17, for example, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Verse 26, so faith without works is dead, also. Or James 2.24, you see then how a man by works is justified and not by faith only. How do we reconcile those very clear statements, and it's not just one, it's multiple times in this passage, that speak about how faith doesn't seem to be enough. Now we believe that as we stand before God, as he looks into our hearts, he can see whether or not there's faith there, no matter how small it is. And by grace we're saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So what is James talking about here in this passage? Because whatever it is, it is clearly important. We find an entire chapter of the New Testament given to it. In fact, as you'll discover in a few moments, not merely James, but our Lord Jesus Christ taught exactly the same thing that James is teaching here in James chapter 2, though sometimes we don't make that connection. Do you understand it? Have you applied this passage to your life? Do you know how this passage applies to your life? Faith without works is dead. Some time ago I did a series on the spiritual gifts and you'll recall that one of the spiritual gifts was the gift of faith. And we saw that the gift of faith gives every believer the capacity to grow spiritually when they choose to walk by faith. And we'll be touching on that again a little later in this message, the Lord willing. Faith gives every believer the capacity to grow spiritually when we choose to walk by faith. That spiritual gift is stated in 1 Corinthians 12, 9. It's listed as a spiritual gift also in 1 Corinthians 12 and in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Paul is listing the gifts in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now, let me pause for just a moment because this is going to be key in the message today. The manifestation. The manifestation. That is something that is visible. The Holy Spirit is invisible, but he has a manifestation. Something that becomes visible. Notice also, he uses the words, is given to every man to profit with all. Did you notice when we read the James chapter 2 passage, he said that word twice. In fact, in verse 14, he says, What doth it profit, my brethren? And then at the end of verse 16, he says, You give them not those things which are needful for the body. What doth it profit? Paul, in verse 7 of chapter 12, says, The manifestation, and he's going to list spiritual gifts, is given to every man to profit with all. 
Paul and James are not in disagreement. Paul emphasizes justification by faith. But James gives to us some practical aspects of faith and works together. And the connector is that which is profitable, that which is manifest, that which is visible in the life of the true Christian. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Verse 9, to another faith by the same Spirit. And then he goes on and lists many other of the spiritual gifts as you run through verse 12. It's also clear from the word of God that faith is a gift from God to every believer, otherwise no one would ever believe and be saved. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, you know those verses. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it, and that refers back to faith, that's your nearest antecedent. For by grace you're saved through faith, and that, that is faith, is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But you know what verse 10 says? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Paul does not sever faith from works. Too often we quote only verses 8 and 9. Too often we know only verses 8 and 9. But verse 10, Paul, just like James, makes the connection between faith and works. He makes it clear that faith is a gift from God. He makes it clear that the works that we do that glorify God are predestined by God. So yes, God is the one who gets the glory for it. But there is a connection. It is not severed between the two. The Apostle Paul also tells us the divinely given faith is proportional. This is very important because we'll discover the same teaching by our Lord Jesus Christ as we look at both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark. Faith is proportional in the life of every believer. Romans chapter 12 verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, According as God hath dealt to every man, listen to these words, the measure, the measure of faith. Now you ladies who cook, and some of you men who like to cook, I like to cook also, know that you have to measure the ingredients. And different types of recipes require different amounts of ingredients, even when sometimes they're using the same ingredients. You don't always put in one cup of flour, for example, in everything that you make. Sometimes it might be half a cup, sometimes it might be one cup, sometimes it might be two cups, sometimes you might not have flour in the mix at all. But God gives a measure of faith to every man, it says in verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 3, a measure of faith. There are also some striking differences as well as similarities with the faith as the spiritual gift and faith that is spoken of in the text today that we are looking at in the book of James. Faith is said in contrast to works by Paul in Ephesians, but it's connected to works which are the result, as Paul points out. But in James, faith is set in complement, not in contrast to works. By the way, compliment, spelled with an E, not with an I. Uh, when you spell it with an E, it means to complete. And James uses that term, by the way, in the text, where it is made perfect, where it is made complete. The works are made complete. Are they complete? Genuine faith. They do not merely say nice things about faith. That would be an I in the word compliment. When you compliment someone, you say nice things about them. When you have a compliment, you are completing it. And here we see works complete faith. That's the way James puts it. You recall that when we studied the gift of faith, we mentioned that the term faith is used in at least five different ways in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. 
There is saving faith. There is sanctifying faith. There is the spiritual gift of faith. We see faith is listed as one of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. We find that when the word faith has the definite article, the word the in front of it, when we speak of the faith, which is once and for all delivered unto the saints, as we see in the book of Jude, is referring to a body of revealed truth that's handed down to us from those who have gone before us, the faith, once and for all delivered to the saints, that we are to pass on to others. We have the description of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then we find some examples that are given to us of faith as you move through Hebrews chapter 11. Men and women who walked by faith, and you see the practical results of their faith in action. That's what James is talking about. He's talking about a genuine faith that is a faith in action. A faith that does not simply sit hidden in some kind of a, a nest egg that's been buried in the ground. But a faith that grows. A faith that produces. A faith that becomes visible. A faith that expands. A faith that gets larger. A faith that walks forward. The scripture is not in contradiction of itself. It is in complement, one truth with the other. Now here's something I hope you will never forget. Genuine faith always results in action. Genuine faith always results in action. Genuine faith always results in in works of righteousness. Not just any action, but specific action. Genuine faith always results in works of righteousness. You will never find it outside that context anywhere in Scripture. Too often, those who have inherited the great tradition of the Reformation have fallen into the lethargy of, well, since God is sovereign and God does what he wants, I don't have to do anything. James says they prove that they don't have genuine faith. They have theology in the head, but they do not have genuine faith in their heart, because genuine faith always results in works of righteousness. James 2, 17 and 18. So even faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Have you ever tried to show somebody how much you believe by doing nothing? <laughs> Pretty hard, isn't it? You can talk about it all you want all day long, but they will not see it. You can talk about how this is bad and that is good, and this is good and that is bad. But unless you act, they will not see that you have faith, they merely see you have criticism. Genuine faith always results in works of righteousness. That is what we see if we continue reading into the next verse in Ephesians 2 passage. We quoted it a moment ago. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God made a machine that works. He didn't make a dilly-dally machine. He did not make one of those Rube Goldberg inventions that they used to have the cartoons with all these different things happen and then at the end something stupid happens. God made us to accomplish something. God made us, we are his workmanship, we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, and God guarantees the machine's going to work the way he made it. Because it says, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's movement. 
that's accomplishment. God himself has ordained it, so if you don't see it in your life, you better be careful about the way you deal with verses 8 and 9. Claiming that you're saved by faith, and that's alone, and so, well, I can wash my hands of that and I can walk away. No, because if you've been genuinely saved by faith, you are created in Christ Jesus on two good works. And God has before ordained those good works in your life. They're going to show up. If they don't show up, that's why Paul says, you know, you better examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith or whether you be reprobate. Are you really saved? A lot of people go to church every week. A lot of people sit in the pews every week. A lot of people smile and grin at all the people around them. A lot of people shake the hands. You know, we like to shake hands, or at least I do here in this church. That's not what saves you. What shows up in your life Monday through Saturday? God has ordained good works that we should walk in them. In other words, there are two key elements that interplay in these passages. Faith always precedes works of genuine righteousness, not sometimes, but always. It always precedes, it goes before, faith goes before the good works of genuine righteousness. Faith always produces works of genuine righteousness, not sometimes, but always. It precedes and it produces. That is why you cannot do good works in order to obtain salvation. That is also why you cannot claim to be saved even though you never do good works from the divine perspective. Why? Because God predestined good works to be performed by the elect to whom he has given the saving faith that we've spoken of a moment ago. Now what are good works? People say, man, I want to make sure I got that list down so I'll go out and do them. What are good works? from God's perspective. What are biblical good works? Biblical good works are not defined by cultural standards. Biblical good works are not defined by reason. Biblical good works are not defined by humanitarian standards. Biblical good works are not defined by government welfare programs. Biblical good works are not defined by social mores. Biblical good works are not defined by the vote of the people. Biblical good works are not defined by political agenda. Biblical good works are not defined by extra biblical revelation or extra biblical texts. Biblical good works are not defined by emotionalism or empathetic appeals for money and goods. Biblical good works are not defined by the law. No. The Bible gives a fourfold standard for good works that please God and all truly good works must be done with these four elements. Number one, Biblical good works are always done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Always, not sometimes. Always done in the power of the Holy Spirit, never in the power of the flesh. If the flesh is involved, God calls it a filthy rag. It's not a good work. Number two, biblical good works are always done, not sometimes. They are always done to the glory of God. If they're done to the glory of man, if they're done to the glory of something else, it's not a biblical good work. Number three, biblical good works are always done, not sometimes, always done in obedience to the word of God. If what you do is in disobedience to the word of God, it is not a good work in the eyes of God. Disobedience is never a good work. And number four, Biblical good works are works that are done by faith. They're not the works that are done by the compulsion of the law. They're not the works that are done by some other standard. Biblical good works are always the works that are done by faith. Where you have seen what the Word of God says, which you've heard what the Word of God says, and you say, that's scary, but I will do it. Because I believe God has commanded it. Biblical good works are always done by faith, and that's what ties us in to our message today. Anything that misses one of those four defining characteristics does not count as a good work in the sight of God. Remember Ephesians 2.10? We read it a moment ago. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. It's in Christ Jesus unto good works. 
If it would not be in Christ Jesus, it's not a good work. All four of those standards are in Christ Jesus. Anything outside of those standards are not in Christ Jesus. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are his workmanship, not our own workmanship. The potter makes the pot as he wills, not as the pot wills. And you know that. In Romans chapter 9, down in verse 21 and following, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? That he might make known the riches of the glory, of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. That's you, that's me, if we've trusted Christ. But God will be glorified in us. He made us, he prepared us unto glory. Do you reflect that to the world around you? Do they see Christ in you, the hope of glory? Do they see when they observe your works, give glory to God? They should, if you're a vessel prepared unto glory. He created us unto good works, just like he created birds to fly, fish to swim. Those are things that they must do. You never saw a fish climbing a ladder. You never saw a bird that put on a hat and went spelunking. Birds are made to do certain things, fish are made to do certain things, and God's elect are made to do certain things. We will do it if we are among his elect. They might argue that's not fair for him to hold us accountable for not doing good works if he's the one who predestines the good works. But of course, if that were true, the obverse would also be true. You can say, well, if that's not fair, then it's also not fair that he would give us heavenly rewards for doing the good works, and yet he does. He's the one who ordained them, and yet he gives us heavenly rewards for doing the good works that he ordained, that he empowered, and that he caused us to do. So never say that it's not fair what God has done. That was the argument of Romans chapter 9, of course. No, the correct response and the understanding is this. It is all of God, and it is nothing of man, and yet he chooses to exercise his grace toward us and give us that which we do not deserve. If he gave us what we deserve, we would all end in hell. The question is not, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? The real question is, how can a just and righteous God send anyone to heaven? The first question assumes that God owes us something. How can a loving God send anyone to hell? It fails to recognize that God is holy and just. The really difficult issue is how can he send anyone to heaven? It's easy to see how he could send people to hell with all the wickedness that we have around us. The hard issue is how could he send anyone to heaven? And the answer to that is the cross. God himself provided the sacrifice. God himself was the lamb who took our place. Some will argue predestination to salvation and good works is fatalism. If you teach that, you're teaching Hindu or pagan fatalism. You're teaching hopelessness and despair, but that's not what the Bible says. There's an enormous difference between fatalism and predestination. There's an enormous difference between fatalism and election. There's an enormous difference between the sovereignty of God and the grinding inescapable wheels of fate. You see, in fatalism, there is no moral responsibility. In fatalism, there is no moral accountability. In fatalism, there is nothing that a man who wants to escape can do to escape the jaws of the inevitable. Fatalism presents man as earnestly desiring to please the gods. But no matter what he does, the gods capriciously beat him to a pulp. 
Under fatalism, a man becomes jaded and bitter and soon ceases to believe in the gods and turns to naturalism and the law of the tooth and fang known today under the rubric of evolution. Under fatalism, he has no hope because in the end he knows that he's dead and believes that death ends it all. He believes he started out as good, but that forces outside of his control ground him down while he heroically struggled to hold back the overwhelming odds. Fatalism starts with the wrong view of man, and that's why fatalism ends in hopelessness. Predestination starts with the view that man is depraved, rotten, filthy, vile sinner. Not only is there nothing good that he can do in the sight of a holy God, but more importantly, he does not want to do right. He starts in rebellion against God. He starts with a view that God must conform to man's way of salvation, to man's definition of good works, to man's self-centered concept of righteousness, to justice and fair play. Man, from the biblical view, is not in a heroic struggle against a petty, recalcitrant, capricious God to do good against all odds. No, from the biblical standpoint, man is in a rebellious struggle against a merciful and gracious God who has paid an infinite price for our salvation. The truth that God predestines our genuine good works of faith also cements the truth stated in the title of this message, Faith Without Works is Dead. The fact that God predestines our truly good works gives us the key to the text today. Any man that claims that he has faith but has no good works, characterized by the divine requirements for good works, we give four of them, remember, proves that he's not saved. The man that claims he has faith but it never results in a changed life proves that he is a fraud, a professor but not a possessor. Yes, God can see the faith that's in your heart, but no man can see whether or not you have genuine faith unless it shows up in your visible lifestyle, in your actions, in your speech, in your pursuits in life, in your interests, your activities, your associations, your likes and dislikes, your stand for or against certain things, your willingness to suffer for Christ, your willingness to give sacrificially for the furtherance of the gospel, the way you respond to temptation, the way you respond to trials and tests, the manifestation of spiritual fruit in your life, the manifestation of the spiritual gifts that God has given you to minister to the body of Christ, the way in which you express your emotions, your constant and habitual attitudes, and a score of other visible ways that you manifest the impact that Christ has made in your life. The way you manifest genuine faith and how Christ has changed your life. That's why James says, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Let me give you a simple illustration. I hope this will help. A dead horse in the road doesn't move, no matter how much you beat him. You can sit there all day and beat that dead horse and nothing will happen. The dead horse just sits there and he rots. Can that kind of a horse pull your cart to market? Can it? No. In the same way, can a dead faith save you and get you to heaven? No. Faith is the horse that pulls the cart. You must have the horse in front of the cart, the horse must be alive, then the horse can pull the cart. That's true for faith also. Faith has to come before works. Horse in front of the cart. Faith must be alive, not dead. Then that kind of faith can pull your cart. Faith, that's genuine faith, is a working faith. Faith does not exist in a vacuum as an intangible, ephemeral, vague concept. Genuine faith is alive. Genuine faith functions in the real world. Genuine faith is visible by the results that it produces. Now the world tries to get it all wrong. They go all backward about this. They say, well, I got a dead horse here. So what am I going to do to make it look like it's 
alive. So they, they go out and they say, well, but, you know, I know it's starting to rot, but, but really, it's okay. And they pour gallons of perfume on it to make it smell good. Say, but, you know, it, it still doesn't look like it's worth very much. It's dead horse meat. So they pile plastic jewelry from China on top of it and say, look how valuable it is. It's real! Say, well, yeah, I don't know about that. So I say, well, look, here, I've got some artificial flowers. We <laughs> poke it into the horse's ear and got this artificial flower we learned. That is what the world does. That is what fake Christians do. They try to distract you from the fact that they don't have living faith, they've got dead faith. They try to make everything look pretty and nice. But it doesn't move. No, the correct response and understanding is this. It is all of God and nothing of man. That's why James starts his challenge by saying, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Can that kind of faith save you? A faith that's like the dead horse, that has gallons of perfume poured on it so it doesn't stink too bad, has all kinds of plastic pseudo jewelry piled on top of it so it looks like it's valuable, that has a, a wiggling fake flower sticking out its ear that blows in the wind so it looks like there's something going on. Can that kind of faith save you? That's James' question. And the answer he gives is no. What you say with your mouth, if it's not followed up by your life, is hypocrisy. It's a lie. It is not genuine faith. The Old Testament, then the New Testament was written down, inspired. The written word of God became the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. You know the confessions. You know the creeds. It's the final authority not merely in matters of, quote, faith, but practice. The two are not severable. They're joined together. The written word of God, the Bible is complete. No more revelation is being given. Faith is when we believe the word of God on whatever subject matter is at hand. The book of Hebrews portrays God as the author and finisher of our faith. He's the author. That's the point of salvation. He's the finisher. That's the sanctification of our faith. It's not of us. It's all of God. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. There's movement. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, your faith may lead you into trouble. If it is alive, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, Living faith moves. Faith is not stagnant in the book of James. It is clear that God designs to make our faith grow by allowing us to go through the trials of life. Things that are active and are alive grow, and they mature. Things that are dead do not grow. James makes that point in chapter 1. In fact, beginning in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this that the trying of what? Your Faith. The book of James has a lot to say about faith. The trying, the testing, the putting through the fire of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's the word for that which is complete, that which is mature. You see, faith can grow. It may start out very small, but as you begin to walk in the Christian life, and as you are put through the trials and tests of life, and as you look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, your faith begins to grow. It becomes stronger. It becomes visible. Every time the church has been persecuted throughout the 2,000 years of history that we've seen so far, can the pagans extinguish it, or does it suddenly begin to blossom and grow? You look at church history, it blossoms and grows. The believers become stronger. The believers begin to multiply as they're doing in China today. Where there's persecution, the believers realize what we have in eternity is worth more than what we have here on earth. It may happen here in America, folks. 
At that point, you will begin to realize what you have in eternity is worth more than what you have here on earth. A living faith is a growing faith. Let's analyze that passage very quickly. We're almost out of time here. The James passage that we have, starting in verse 14, James chapter 2. Let's look at how faith and works function as a unit. Verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? The first issue related to proving genuine faith is its profitability. I mentioned that a moment ago. That's found in both verse 14 and 16. James asks the question, What doth it profit? If you claim to have faith and it is not profitable for the body of Christ, it is not genuine faith. Listen to that carefully. If you claim to have faith and it is not profitable to the body of Christ, it is not genuine faith. No, well, it's not a faith that profits you. Did you notice that context? This is not the charismatic teaching. This is faith that profits someone else. The modern charismatic movement tells you if you just have enough faith, you will get rich. You will get possessions. You will get power or whatever else they're promising or fame, you know, fortune, other stuff from the world. That's not what these verses are saying. The issue is a brother or sister needing clothing and food. Genuine faith profits somebody else in the body. The second issue is that genuine active faith is discernment. Is this a need or a greed? The brother or sister is naked. That means either no clothes or totally and utterly inadequate clothing to keep warm in the cold. Be ye warmed and filled. Genuine faith discerns a genuine need and acts immediately to meet that need. The third issue of genuine active faith is the object of the action. If a brother or sister be naked. James is not issuing a general call to feed and clothe the world of pagans. James is saying that by feeding and clothing other Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, we show the world what true Christian, Christian love is in the family of God. And you know something? The world will notice it. That's a, an attractive drawing card to make the unbelievers want to know more about what is this love that draws these believers together. What the world needs from Christians is not the money that God has given to us. What the world needs from Christians is the gospel of Christ that he has entrusted to us. Our first and foremost responsibility is not to provide for the physical needs of the world, but the spiritual needs of the world. In that process, we may also help them, but the primary call for food and clothing here in this passage is for other believers. The fourth issue of genuine active faith is that it is not the Lone Ranger. Tonto is always there. Did you catch that? So I didn't see Lone Ranger or Tonto in any of those verses. How about verse 17? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now those of you who used to watch the TV series about the Lone Ranger know that if it had not been for Tonto, the Lone Ranger would have been dead from the very beginning and there would have been no TV series about the Lone Ranger and Tonto. You remember the story. A group of Texas Rangers rode into a box canyon where they were ambushed by a gang of bank robbers, horse thieves, and cattle rustlers. All the Rangers were killed except one. Tonto was out there hunting some time later and found that one badly wounded Ranger pulled him into a cave with water and nursed him back to health. In almost every other episode thereafter, Tonto was always there. I don't think there was ever a Lone Ranger episode that was produced where Tonto wasn't in it somehow. And Tonto was frequently the instrument in saving the life of the Lone Ranger again, either by hearing about a plot that was about to happen, or providing a getaway horse, usually silver, high ho silver away, or drawing the fire of the bad guys so the Lone Ranger could finish them off. If we can compare the Lone Ranger, who is the hero, to faith, and Tonto to works, perhaps we can understand verse 17 a little better. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Even so, the Lone Ranger, if he had not Tato, was dead, being alone. Number five, faith and works are a unit, with the works as the visible manifestation of genuine faith. Verse 18, Ye a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Did you notice it says, If a man may say, James is looking at the visible proof that people can see. 
We know that God can see the heart of man and tell if there's genuine faith present, but James is talking about the practical Christian walk in the eyes of the watching world. If somebody is watching you to see if your Christian faith is real, he will never be able to see your faith if it does not show up in your visible actions, in your visible reactions, in your visible convictions put into practice in real life. Number six, genuine faith is not merely theological. It is theology, but it's not merely theological. Genuine faith is life-changing. Look at verse 19. Why did he throw this one in? Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Having it in your head, knowing about it, knowing that it's true, knowing that it's absolutely true, do you think the demons know absolutely that there is a God? I think so. Do you think the devil knows absolutely that there is a God? No question about it. Do you think that they are out there running around and trying to do bad things wondering, I wonder if there's a God up there that we're going to have to give account to someday? Do you think there's any question in their mind who the true and living God really is? Are they confused by the Muslim Allah? Are they confused by Buddha? Are they confused by some kind of a Hindu pagan god, Kali, or one of the other gods of Hinduism? They say, man, I wonder which one of those is really God. Do you think they are? Of course not. The demons know who the true God is. The demons at one point were in the presence of the true God. The demons know the effect of the true God consigning them and their leader, the devil, and casting them out of heaven and ultimately casting them into the lake of fire. They know who he is. Do you think that intellectual knowledge is genuine faith? Saving faith? Do you think they're going to be in heaven? James is making an obvious point. No, they will not be. Doesn't matter how much theology you know. Doesn't matter how much you know about God. It doesn't matter. Genuine faith is life transformational, not merely theological. Number seven, severed faith is a vain doctrine of men. Severed faith is a vain doctrine of men, James 2.20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. There are several words that are translated vain in the New Testament. This is the word that means empty. People who try to tell you that the Reformation doctrine of justification by faith alone means that we've totally gotten away from the quote Catholic doctrine of good works you know what they're missing the point Catholic good works are necessary for their perverted doctrine of salvation but Reformation good works are the visible content of genuine faith it is here important to understand the doctrines of justification and imputation imputation two key doctrines of the Reformation Imputation is the doctrine that tells us that we are made righteous by faith alone. Although it's more complex than this, there are two basic stages to the doctrine of imputation. Number one, God transferring, it's a, it's a bookkeeping term, look at Zamai, it means to transfer money from one account into another account. That's the word translated imputation. God transferred the sin of the world to Christ on the cross. Second stage. God transfers divine righteousness of Christ to those who believe. That's faith. Without the transfer of divine righteousness, which is step two, a man cannot get to heaven. Divine righteousness is only transferred to those who believe. Only the elect, those whom God gives saving faith to, have divine righteousness transferred to their account. The doctrine of justification is set in contrast to the doctrine of imputation. In fact, it's set in contrast in our passage today in James chapter 2. Justification is not what makes us righteous, that's imputation. Justification is what declares us righteous. We are declared righteous in the sight of God by faith alone, because he can see our hearts. And that's what Paul is talking about in Romans and Galatians where he's fighting that issue. Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall there no flesh be justified, that is, declared righteous in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. 
Verse 24, being justified free by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You're declared righteous freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That follows the declaration of faith in verse 20, four verses earlier. Verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That's Paul's argument. How does God look at it? How does God see it? Where does God look? He looks inside the heart. He doesn't look at the phony, fake action, uh, stuff on the outside. He doesn't smell the perfume you put on the dead horse. He doesn't look at the plastic jewels that you put on the dead horse. He doesn't look at the plastic flower that you stuck in the dead horse's ear. He looks inside. Is there any life in here? No, it's dead. But if he sees life inside, he declares you righteous. He makes you righteous by imputation. He looks inside and sees, is there life there? He declares you righteous. That's the difference between imputation and justification. We're declared righteous in the sight of men by our works. Notice that this contrast in James. James is very, very careful to distinguish between justified and imputed. Did you, when you were listening to that passage, did you just blend it together? Or did you notice that James uses both those different words and he uses them in different contexts? When he's talking about our works and talking about being justified by works, he's using it in the context of what men can see. When he talks about imputation, he uses it in the context of a man believing and God looking in his heart. Let me give you an illustration. Romans chapter 4, talking about Abraham. There are going to be two heroes of faith, and Abraham is one of them that James talks about. Let's see what Paul says about him in Romans chapter 4. Abraham was righteous before God, and notice the word imputation. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. You say, well, that's okay for Abraham. What about us? Okay, he goes on with us in the next verse. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe. That's faith on him that raised up our uh, Jesus our Lord from the dead. Imputation is what makes you righteous. And that's what, when God looks down from heaven, he makes you righteous because he gives you faith. But then how does the rest of the world know it? When the world looks at you, what do they see? James is quite clear to make it clear that imputation is the point of salvation in our same passage in verse 23 it says the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God did you see how James in those earlier verses in verses 14 through 22 he was talking about justification and he was talking about people now he gives the illustration of Abraham and he first starts talking about imputation and he goes only to faith very important to read what the text says. God inspired the words of Scripture. He didn't mush them all together and give you a general vague idea. He used terms so that we would understand the truth and how it applies to real life. With that distinction in mind, and our time is up, I've got to at least give you this. Look at the two illustrations that James gives, a good man and a bad woman. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Was that visible or invisible? It was visible. He did a physical action. He dragged a, a young teenager up to the top of Mount Moriah. He bound him with cords. He laid him on top of an altar. He raised a knife. Was that visible or invisible? Is that something you and I could have seen? or something we could not have seen. It was something that was visible. See us all how faith wrought with his works. Because Abraham believed he did what was absolutely abhorrent to him. Book of Hebrews tells it, when he did that, he knew that if he killed Isaac, that God would have to raise him from the dead, because God had promised, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He proved his faith by his works. Getting down here a little further. Verse 24. Ye see then 
how that by works a man is justified, that is declared righteous and not by faith only. That's what you could have looked at. You could have videotaped it if you had a video camera there. You could have taken a snapshot and drawn a picture. And many people have drawn pictures of that, like Michelangelo. Drawn pictures of Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac. It's something you can see. It gives testimony to what was in Abraham's heart. God can see his heart, but you can't. But you can see what he did when God spoke and what God told him to do. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified, remember justified means declared righteous, by works, when she secretly believed in her heart and said, boy, I sure hope the Israelites take the city and boy, I sure hope they don't kill. Is that what it says? Is that what Rahab did? She just sort of huddled in the corner and hoped that one of the walls fell down it with the smusher. She was justified, declared righteous by her works when she received the messengers and had sent them out another way. That's practical, visible action, just like the being warmed and filled that James talks about. And notice something else. She's not commended for her lying, but she's commended for her practical act of faith that risked her life if she was caught. Then verse 26, the last verse of the chapter, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Dear people, faith without works is dead. That's what the Bible says. I wish we had time to look at the passages, but I'll at least give you the reference. Read sometime Mark chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. I'm skipping three pages here of notes because our time is up. Jesus says the same thing that James said. Puts it in a different context, though. In Mark chapter 4, verses 13 through 20, Jesus gives the parable of the sower. And he tells us this in the very first verse. The disciples said, what in the world is that that you were talking about? You know, this guy going out there and sowing and it falls on different kinds of grounds. And what in the world did you mean by that, Jesus? Jesus makes a very important introductory comment. He said unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? In other words, this is the key to all of the other parables, and this is a key to the doctrine of practical Christianity in the rest of the epistles in the New Testament. We'll skip looking at all the different types of soil, but the word is sown in the heart of the individual. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. The seed is the word of God, the different soils of the hearts of men. The seed is scattered abroad, just like the gospel is preached to all the world. There's an equal opportunity, if you will, given to all men to hear and believe. But there's some soil that's been prepared. There's some soil that is good soil. And the seed falls into the good soil. Verse 20, the final verse. These are they which are sown on good ground. That's a heart that's been prepared. Such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit. Three things. Hear it, receive it, and bring forth fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. There is a different amount of fruit in the life of every believer. But there will be fruit. Some believers have immense number of works that God has ordained for them to do, and they do them, and they give glory to God for it. And when he gives them crowns for those things, they take the crowns off and cast them at, their, at his feet because they know that he is the one who did it through them. Some will produce 30-fold. Same thing. When they get their crowns, they will take off the crowns and cast them at his feet. You know the parables of the stewards? Two different parables. One where there are three stewards, one where there are ten stewards who were each given a certain amount of money to invest, 
and to give back to the master. The ones that get the blessing are the ones who do right with what God has given them. The ones who get cursed are the ones who buried in the earth. Jesus says, depart into outer darkness. Your people, what's in your life? Is there any fruit in your life that proves that your heart is good soil? That has received the word that is now producing fruit in your visible life that the world may know? On that soil, some brought forth 30-fold, some 60, some 100, but it all brought forth fruit. Remember, the point that James is making is the visible manifestation of the faith that's in your heart. Faith without works is dead. Being alone. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It reminds us that we have responsibilities and obligations. Yes, we are saved by grace through faith. Our salvation is secure not because of what we've done, but because of your gracious gift of eternal life. Within your sovereign, electing, predestinating plan, your infinite, irrefutable, unstoppable plan, you have reached down and by your mercy and grace have chosen some. Though none of us deserved it, yet you chose some. We cannot question it. The pot cannot say to the potter, why have you made me thus? You chose some. You gave us faith. But you also predestined us unto good works that we should walk in it. Father, perhaps there's some here who have not been producing as they should be. Perhaps they've not been producing because they have a fake faith, the plastic flowers, the fake jewelry, the perfume covering the stink. Their faith is a dead faith like the dead horse. It can do nothing but sit there and rot. Father, please help us to each examine our own hearts, whether or not we are in the faith, or whether or not we are reprobate. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and your word has gone forth today. I pray, Father, that you will take your word and use it to quicken the hearts of any who are here who do not have genuine faith. They have an imitation faith, a plastic faith, a pseudo-faith, but not the faith that saves. Because the faith that saves is the faith that always produces works of righteousness to the glory of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's always a faith that is in obedience to the word of God. It's a faith that shows itself and manifests itself to the world around. And Father, we pray that you might cause each and every one of us to have that kind of a faith, that we might rejoice in the day that we see Jesus and hear him say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 16, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.